besides the novelty aspect, because anytime you change your workout, so long as it's appropriate, you're going to see your body respond again. Besides that, there are distinct advantages to lightweight training that uh, heavyweight training simply doesn't have. There's obviously you know, more than one way to, to, to get you know, the kind of physique that you want. And the hypertrophy um, happens in a lot of different rep ranges. And there are advantages to lightweights, just like there's advantages to heavyweights, because there's value even if your goal is maximal strength and not muscle hypertrophy. One of the best things you could do to develop your muscles, build an amazing body, is to lift with lightweights, not heavyweights, but actually lightweights. Do you guys remember the first time like this kind of came together for you? Like I think for the first like three to five years of lifting for me, mm -hmm. I was because I was the skinny kid who was trying to build muscle, and then like all the information I was reading back then was like you got to lift heavy weight, low reps. Like yeah. if you if you want to tone muscles and get lean, then you yep. do high reps. I'm like I don't want anything to do with toning or leaning. No. So everything I did was like six reps and as heavy as could be for probably three years before I ever lifted a weight more than 10 reps. And I remember meeting a personal trainer and this guy was like jacked. And I, yeah. and I came up to him and said, Oh, what do you, do? I think I was asking him like, what do you do? What's the best thing for your arms? That cliche thing that everybody asks, yeah. you know? All right. And he's just like, well, tell me what you know you're doing. And I kind of told him how I train. He says, Oh, he says, uh, lift 15 reps. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Oh, my arms get smaller. He's like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. I remember doing it. And then like, it, they exploded over that summer and I went like, Boom, yeah. yeah. I, I thought that there. was just for jazzercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you want to do all those reps, you know, like I, I figured that was for that until I saw this really jacked bodybuilder who was doing lightweight and, and multiple reps. And I, I was working out at, at world's gym and I was talking to the guy and he was like telling me all the benefits of, you know, being able to make that weight feel heavier and like really slowing down the cadence and, you know, grinding his way through that and all that. And I was like, really, that's effective. And, you know, he was selling me on it pretty hard. And it was obviously it took a guy that was like pretty jacked to even get me there. Yeah. For me, it was an article in uh, flex magazine. So I would read all the bodybuilding magazines and same thing like you, like you, Adam, I just train heavy all the time, six reps or lower all the time, no matter what the exercise was. And then there was this bodybuilder on there that goes, oh, I, I don't ever go lower than 20 reps. And of course, he looked amazing. And I thought, and then he talked about past bodybuilders who trained this way as well. Serge Nubre is a, is, a, is a famous one. He's the guy that got, you know, in Pumping Iron, he's the French uh, bodybuilder who got yeah. like uh, second place, I think. Uh, and then Lou got third or whatever. Incredible physique. So I said, I'm going to try this out. And of course, because it was novel and different, uh, my body responded very quickly. And I think I put on five pounds of muscle very, very fast. And that was the first time I learned that there's obviously you know, more than one way to, to, to get you know, the kind of physique that you want and that hypertrophy um, happens in a lot of different rep ranges. And there are advantages to lightweights, just like there's advantages to heavyweights. And if you avoid lightweight training, you miss out on a lot of the advantages that you can get. Yeah, it's that. interesting because, I mean, going through, um, you know, sport-specific training and, like, like strength training, it was just about loading weights. And, like, you're in these groups and you're always trying to figure out how mm -hmm. I can press uh, my max further so I can get more weight. When I started to learn all these other variables in terms of being able to load your body by, um, you know, holding and sustaining a, a pose or position for longer or, like, slowing it down, like, how much harder it was in a lot of different directions not to take a left on the conversation but since you brought him up why did he never win surge do i think i think his physique was better like and i know i'm gonna say something that's like blasphemy i feel like don't but say it yes i think his, his physique was better than arnold's you know what it is why uh, in a picture alone Serge bray looks incredible you have him stand next to arnold is he tall? Is that what it is? Is Arnold like significantly not taller? Not just taller, just a lot bigger. Is he? Yeah, he just got dwarfed when you would see them together. Um, and Serge's legs weren't that uh, weren't that exceptional. Like, what um, do you think? Like, was he as tall at, as Arnold? Uh, he was tall, but he wasn't as tall. But if you had them standing next to each other, he just got dwarfed. Yeah, and that's what. But he beat he beat Lou in the 1974 Olympia or 75, I think. Did it was. he ever win? Because I, I didn't think he no. won, he never won. No, huh? but he was he would win other competitions and stuff and. 
you know, he, he looked incredible. What do you think, Doug? You're really good at judging male physiques. What yeah. do you, what, you say? <laughs> Let's get a real nice yeah, I don't know. I'd, yeah. I'd definitely go for his, personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seems, seems Arnold's like just type. a little too big for me. <laughs> Whoa. I mean, yeah, yeah that's it was, what does it for he you. He was huh? up there with, like, Frank Zane. You know, Frank Zane had a physique like that, right? Real aesthetic. Yeah, but, I mean, nice. Frank was, like, small and lean, right? And by, and I Frank was one of my favorite physiques, for sure, because I think I identified as, like, the skinny guy, and, like, that looked more realistic yeah, to no, me. No, look up 1974 or 75. Olympia um, and look at the uh, the lineup and then you can kind of see when he stands next to Arnold um, he gets you know he gets see I've seen all this and that's what makes me say this because I, I don't think he does I think Serge looks yeah. put together but anyway he did he did high volume high rep training he would sometimes get the reps as high as 30 40 50 repetitions um, and uh, you know he developed an incredible physique now even Arnold okay even Arnold who <laughs> went through periods of you know heavy training and powerlifting also would incorporate higher repetitions uh, in his training as well because he identified that his body would respond great when he would switch it up. Yeah. But but besides the novelty aspect, because anytime you change your workout, so long as it's appropriate, you're going to see your body respond again. Besides that, there are distinct advantages to lightweight training that uh, heavyweight training simply doesn't have. Boom, what's up? It's Mind Pump time. Here's the giveaway for today. Uh, I'm going to give away Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and Maps Anywhere. You may be wondering why that combination. First off, it's a very popular three-workout combo, but also we're running a promotion this month, which ends August 14th, where we take our most popular workout combos and only make them $99.99. So I'm going to give one of them away. It's Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, Maps Anywhere. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section, and you'll win that combo. Now, everyone else, go to mapsaugust.com. Remember, this ends August 14th. And what we did is we took our most popular workout program combinations. There's a lot of them on there. There's a bunch of them. It's like, for example, one of them is Maps Aesthetic and Maps Split. It's a bodybuilding combo. So we have a whole bunch of combos. Each combination is only $99.99, which is less than the price of one program. So it's essentially buy one, get one or two free. You got to check this out. We're ending this on the 14th because it's a crazy sale. Again, it's mapsaugust.com. All right, here comes the show. The first one, and this one's an obvious one, and this also highlights uh, a, this, what a lot of trainers experience, which is we're usually way better with our clients than we are with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like I was a way better trainer with my clients than I was with myself for a long time. And I would always go lighter uh, to make sure that they had perfect form. Whereas when I train myself, I would sacrifice form in the pursuit of going heavier. And there's tremendous benefit to having perfect form. Tremendous benefit. Well, we're always battling our own ego. And I think that, um, yeah, we're always better training our, our clients in that direction. And it was – you know, so much better to manage uh, the quality of each rep, you know, with a lighter weight and, and being able to really be focused and conscious of uh, how your body was like maybe wavering or like you're able to make those micro adjustments a lot more effectively uh, without overloading your body. Well, it's really difficult to, you know, correct form on somebody when they're doing, you know, four to six reps and and like towards, you know, you're working at eight, you're working at 80 percent of their max load. Yeah. And they're moving way, and they're a beginner. Like they're they're all over the place, and they're letting the probably the weight just drop down right away. So to be able to critique form, I mean, it it was almost impossible. So I actually started all my clients uh, on a, a lightweight protocol first, so I could get the form down. Yeah, because there's a few things that lift the weight when you're training with weight or resistance. Obviously, muscle muscle is one of them, and what controls muscles is central nervous system. So that's all connected. But you can also use leverage. So you can adjust and change your leverage so that the weight becomes lighter uh, or feels lighter. You can also use momentum, um, meaning, you know, like a curl is a good example. I could swing the weight up, which will allow me to lift more weight than if I were just very, very stable and stationary lifting the weight. So those two things can do that. And leverage, typically how you adjust your positioning to give you better leverage is you, you compromise your form, right? So like another example would be a bench press. You know, you can't get the weight up and a real common way people will instinctively adjust the leverage is by pushing their butt up off the bench, right? You see someone's butt come off the bench mm -hmm. and they can lift more. Another way, and this is another way, real common way that people will use, will adjust their technique 
to get better leverage is to shorten the repetition. Mm -hmm. So like a full squat or a <clears throat> squat where you're going below parallel, you're just not going to be as strong as one where you're going either to parallel or above. And you'll see this where someone will add weight to the bar and all of a sudden their rep becomes an inch or two shorter, right? So yeah, they're lifting heavy weight, heavier weight, but the rep, the rep now is shorter is that a was that a good trade? No. In fact, we say this all the time on the podcast that form and technique is paramount. That's the most important thing that you can pay attention to because an exercise done properly, forget safety and we'll get there. That's part of it. A exercise performed properly just it's just give you better results. You just get more value from muscle building, fat burning, sculpting your body with a better rep than you do with a worse rep, regardless of the how much heavier the weight is. Well, well you'd see a, an issue too in the strength world where I was kind of like coming through where you'd get that momentum. Like you wanted to, to build that elastic potential energy. So you'd so for instance, for like a bench press, you get the bouncing of the chest to get, <laughs> you know, just to get that momentum to now, you know, where I get halfway up just from that momentum, I can extend, you know, using my muscles at that point. But, uh, you know, and technique wise, you know, to slow down and really like get through like each phase of that contraction was important to establish first. Well, good luck trying to teach a client how to connect to a muscle with really heavy weight. Mm. I mean, there's so much going on when they, when they're trying to, struggle through five or six reps that and you're over here trying to teach contract your packs right, contract right. And, and then their shoulders are firing their triceps are firing they're just trying to move that and grind through that weight so i think one of the huge benefits of going light is if which is so important to teach especially when you're talking about building hypertrophy like building muscle uh, is the ability to connect to the, the proper muscle that we're trying to work in that exercise. Yes. And so going, slowing it down so I can communicate that while they're lifting is almost impossible with really heavy weight. Well, think of it this yeah. way, right? So I'll, I'll use the bench press as an example. I'm going to come up with, these are arbitrary numbers, okay? But let's, we know that the prime muscles involved in a bench press is the chest, the shoulders, and the triceps. Now, it's much more than that, obviously, but those are the prime movers. And let's just say, um, for argument's sake, that uh, the chest is 70% uh, of the lift, okay? And then you have, uh, let's say, 15% uh, that goes to the shoulders, and then the remainder goes to the triceps. Well, let's say you have a weaker chest, but stronger shoulders. Well, your number may look more like 65, 25, for example, but you want to develop your chest. You really want to work on your chest. Your shoulders are so strong that they're lifting more than what would be considered ideal. Well, what happens when you add more weight is you're going to stay at that ratio. Mm -hmm. Your body is going to use its strengths in the most efficient, effective way possible to lift the weight. But what if I want this to be a, ch a real chest press? What if my goal of doing the bench press is not to lift the most weight, but rather I want to develop my chest. I want to get my chest from doing 65% of the lift to doing 75% of the lift or 85% of the lift. How can I do that? Well, I can't go heavier and do that. In fact, if I go heavier, the opposite's going to happen. I have to go lighter, concentrate and focus on making these weaker muscles, and in, in, in the case of this example would be the chest, do more of the work. That can only happen if I go loud, lighter and, and connect to the target muscle. So this is why you see people with lagging body parts yeah. mm -hmm. do a compound lift that's supposedly good for that body part, like, oh, squat's good for the glutes, but my glutes keep lagging. Why the hell are my quads growing all the time? You got to go lighter and make yeah. the glutes do more work. And that only can happen if you go lighter and connect. I think, yeah, it's it's a problem if you don't really spend that time connecting and, and being able to understand the muscle recruitment process. It's 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 a big part of it, being able to like have access to muscles. So like it and you see this too if you're just trying to flex a random uh muscle and and you don't have and you can't do that. That's something that you can't do. Like that's you know, something later on, like you're gonna find in these compound lifts where you need to make these adjustments. If I don't have access to that, that's gonna be a problem that's gonna follow you later. Well, I remember, and I don't know if you guys recall or remember this, was being able to identify uh, somebody who struggled with this by the way their body was developed, mm. right? So I'd see like a guy who could like bench press like more weight than I would be like benching 315 plus working out. And he'd have these massive delts and tricep yeah. and he'd have like no chest. And I'd be like, that's so weird. Like this dude benches 315. Why doesn't he have like this massive chest? But then when I when I understood biomechanics and started to watch the way the guy would watch exercise. Watch how he benches. Yeah, he would, he would be benching with his he shoulders. Tucked, yeah. Triceps and He's shoulders. rolled forward slightly, right? Or a flat back as he's as he's benching and he's pushing everything up with his shoulders and his triceps. So he's, and you know he's lifting, he's benching because he knows you want to build his chest. But to your point of the ratio and percentage is like, you know, when it should be a 60% 
chest exercise and maybe split between the shoulders and arms from there, he's very loaded on the shoulders and triceps and getting very little activation in the chest. Yeah. And so they're developing that and, way. And, and that, this is not just true with compound lifts this is, or complex lifts. This is also true with isolation exercises. Like, for example, a lateral, right? Is a common shoulder exercise. You ever see somebody who has weak traps. shoulders? Yeah, who's like they, they have lagging shoulders. Do laterals? It look. There's a lot of trapezius involved. There's a shortened range of motion with the shoulders. How do you fix that? You got to go way lighter, mm -hmm. cut the weight way down, get into the proper position, deactivate. Right, you're not really deactivating, but your goal is to deactivate the muscles that take over, and focus on the target muscles. You can't do that when the weight is heavy. You just can't because when you're lifting a heavier weight, your body is just doing what it can to move the weight up, which means it's going to move the way it always does, which is yeah. why you have you a lot of Train the movement, part. not the muscle at that point. That's the, right. The other point that you brought or you're, you bring up is the injuries, right? So the lower injury risks with lower weight. You know, we had an opportunity. We were just hanging out with uh, Chris Gethlin, right, who's almost 50 years old, yeah. lifetime natural bodybuilder and lifter. Guy looks phenomenal. And uh, when we were talking to him, did you hear him referencing his routine? Like, oh, yeah. He goes real high rep now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was like 50, 40, 30. Yes. He's lifting in the 50 yeah. rep range and stuff like that. And the guy looks great. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, he's built that physique over years and years of probably strength training and lifting and cycling through and stuff like that. But he predominantly now lifts in this super high rep range. And I believe it was Dexter Jackson who was the same way like yeah. this, right? Like super high reps. And one of the things I noticed, I mean, I noticed this when we all got together because before we all started hanging out, I was in that kind of Dexter Jackson bodybuilding type of mentality where it was high reps, supersets. I was always chasing the pump. And then I started hanging out with you guys and I started pursuing more strength. And I now I built a ton of muscle and I got bigger, bigger that way. But I have to be honest, I had more joint issues of than I ever had in my life. Now, mind you, I'm also older, you know, now than what I was probably in my twenties. Probably would have been it probably would have behooved me to actually done lifting like that when I was in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. And I didn't start doing it until my my thirties, start lifting that way. But one of the things I notice is that, you know, my joints start talking to me when I'm consistently lifting really heavy and mm -hmm. they just feel so much better when I'm well, in that besides high risk. Well, besides that risk-reward uh, ratio, right? Yeah. And it's this. like, yeah, if we evaluate that based off of like, uh, so yeah, when I was younger and I was really trying to like build that foundational strength, like I would, I would lean a little bit higher on the risk uh, factors in terms of like what types of exercise to include, the the amount of reps, the loading. But yeah, as you as you scale that, it's like you have to readjust. Look, we'll get to the chronic pain part because that's even that's a different point. But I, this is just pure injury. Okay, if I you know if I have four hundred pounds on my back on a bench press and my form deviates by five percent. Mm my risk of injury is way higher than if I have 225 on my bar uh, on the bar and I deviate just 5%, right? Because when you're really strong at a particular movement, you're really strong by doing that movement a particular way. Once it deviates, stabilizers have, have to kick in. You got to get other muscles to kick in to stop the weight from moving in a direction you don't like. My knee moves a little left or right, or my elbow moves one direction or not. When there's more weight on the bar, it's way harder to stop that momentum. You ever have a deadlift that's real heavy and have the weight shift a little bit and feel your QL want to oh, rip yeah. out of your back, yeah. right? So this is just what happens. Well, so the injury risk is just higher. Yeah, to that point, I mean, I don't think I can recall a single time in my entire lifting career where I actually got injured lifting 15 plus reps. Yeah. I don't think no. I've ever been injured mm -hmm. that way, but I've been injured enough times for sure, you know, hitting PRs or doing singles, doubles or triples or five by five yep. routines where yep. I'm really pushing the weight. So yeah, to that point, you're right. Like it's, it's so much easier to control the weight when it's, it's like that. Than, yeah. And, and if you're, you're less likely to get hurt. And if you mess up on your form with light weight, you can jump back into good form. Yeah. And it's not as bad. You, yeah. you mess up with your form yeah. with heavy weight. Uh, now the risk injury goes yeah. through the through fatigue's the roof. really the only thing like you know stopping you at that point, and, and instead of like pain or like other signals, or just or physics around your joints, yeah, or you, you just know, can't do it, or you can't do it. All right, so this next one is um, very true with high rep, and this is why most people enjoy higher rep training, which is the pump. So the pump is what you feel when you work out, and the muscle fills with blood faster than it gets rid of the blood. You know, the technical term is uh, transient sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, it feels really good. A lot of people like it because of the way they look for the next 20 you know, minutes or so. <laughs> but there's a real muscle building benefit that comes from it. So just the swelling effect that happens in the muscle sends a signal that tells the body we should probably build some muscle. There's also sarcoplasmic hypertrophy that happens in the sense, and it's more permanent, not transient, in the sense that your body's ability to store more glycogen, which is muscle energy, fluid, 
blood, blood vessels, all the structures that are in muscle that are not muscle fibers actually increase in size as well. So when you look at a muscle and you look at the size of a muscle, uh, most of the size of that muscle is not muscle fiber. Most no, of it fluid. is fluid mm -hmm. and non-muscle fiber structures. This is one of the reasons why bodybuilders look bigger than powerlifters, even though powerlifters are so much stronger, is because of this, this effect that you get from the pump. And it's way easier and more effective to get a pump with higher reps than it is with lower reps. Now, the one thing that I, I think I want to caution or warn, because this is something I got trapped here for so long because of this reason. Um, I remember again the the time where I started lifting high reps. I saw I saw the huge gains. It was a new adaptation, uh, and then I also started to like the way I looked because I was all pumped up all the time. And so I found myself chasing the pump all the time, and I think I neglected how much strength training. Uh, that I should have been doing over a good, I don't know, probably 10 years there where I was lifting, where I was constantly chasing this because it does have tremendous benefit. But like any other adaptation, like at, sooner or later, the body will adapt to mm -hmm. it. You'll kind of maximize the results you're getting from that. And it's important that you kind of move out. Oh, of that there's also. there's benefits to heavy training as well uh, that you don't get from light training. Um, but this, you know, this, what we're talking about here is just the benefits of light training. And if you think that you're not going to get the same muscle building effects, right? Uh, from light training, you get with he heavy training. It's not true. Mm -hmm. You'll get great muscle building effects. Now, of course, we've said this many, many times on the show. You want to be able to utilize and train through different phases and utilize and, and you know, get take the advantage of all these different phases. But one of them is light training and one of them is the pump. It is way harder to get a crazy skin splitting pump with five reps than it is with 20 reps. You do one set of 20 reps on squats and your legs are um, you know, pumped. Well, the, the science to support what you're talking about is also the same science that supports what we've learned about blood occlusion. It's the oh. same, same concept, which is something I know you didn't list on here, but that's a that's super lightweight, and you are basically hijacking that uh, that idea of sending as much fluid into yeah. the into the muscle as possible. And I, we have, we wrote a guide. I know we haven't talked about that guide in a really long time, but we wrote a guide on blood occlusion. Um, but the the same science that supports what you're talking about right mm -hmm. now of sending all the fluid into the muscle. Uh, and the benefits of that for building muscle are the same Very similar, yeah. same benefits that you're getting when you do blood occlusion and that same concept. And why that's so powerful and useful is, and I don't, I don't know if this is on here on your points either, is but uh, for rehab purposes, oh, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, is like when you are at a place where you have just recently injured, um, going really heavy uh, at that time is a really bad idea because you could risk getting hurt again versus staying lightweight and then mm -hmm. and pumping blood in there instead. Well, too, and I think that uh, some people like me that would be more focused on strength training exclusively would be worried, uh, you know, that this would affect their their PRs. They would they basically have to start over again, and and this would affect like their strength going forward. When in fact, it had the opposite effect. Where I I felt more stamina, more muscle endurance in terms of like my lifts going back and the carryover that I experienced after going through a hypertrophy block uh, that really contributed towards, uh, you know, newfound strength and stamina yeah, together. I, I broke through so many PRs by getting too stuck in a, in a low rep phase and then doing higher reps and then going back to low reps and then I'm stronger. That happened many times. Yeah. What you're talking about too is strength stamina. I remember when I first saw this, I had two trainers that worked for me. One was a power lifter, one was a bodybuilder and they were very classic like stereotype, right? The power lifter, a lot thicker, you know, kind of heavier looking, very strong bodybuilder, aesthetic physique, the whole deal. And we would have these discussions and they'd tease each other in the gym and it was really fun. Well, anyway, they worked out together one time and it was so interesting to watch how the workout progressed. So the workout started and now here was the mistake the powerlifter made. He followed the bodybuilder's workout. And I say mistake because it was a competitive, you can mm. tell the workout got competitive. The workout started with the powerlifter lifting way more weight than the bodybuilder. But about 45 minutes into the workout, the power, the bodybuilder started lifting more weight than the powerlifter <laughs> because the powerlifter's strength stamina oh, yeah. just wasn't there. Set after set after set, uh, you know, volume training. That was and just different different yeah, I was going to say, Adam would throw these supersets on me and destroy <laughs> me, dude. This like, is how Justin and I used to lift when we were in our in our 20s when we first met. And he was he, we were working in the same gym and we'd lift together. And uh, he was way stronger than I was, definitely. And he he definitely identifies more as the strength power athlete. And I was so the, the bodybuilder guy. So we'd lift in the first 10, 15 minutes 
of our training session, he was stronger in most of this. But by, <laughs> by the back half, I yep. was moving more away. <laughs> but that was because I shortened those rest periods, oh God, threw in so all kinds tired, of reps, yeah. throw some supersets on him, <laughs> but gassed his yeah. ass out. And, and strength yep. stamina is not, it's a type of endurance, but it's really your ability to continue to express strength repeatedly over and over and to recover fast enough to express that strength. Now, what are all the mechanisms at work there, right? So there's obviously benefits cardiovascular there, right? Because your heart rate's sure. increasing. and then Oh, so hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. I mean, you build muscle. That's why bodybuilders train that way. No, but I mean like the ability to increase the gas tank like that. Like obviously it's it's coming from your, your, your strengthening your heart because you're short. ATP is, uh, is, is replenishing faster. You're, you're replenishing glycogen. Faster, you don't get that lactic acid buildup. You're uh, training your body to be able to do that. Right. You are, yeah. um, and it's really interesting that you can. And it's funny, you know, we know that muscle fibers are broken <laughs> up into two main categories, right? Fast twitch and slow twitch, but it's way more complex than that. There are fast twitch fibers that act more like a, a hybrid between slow twitch and fast twitch. And we've, they've proven you can morph well, them too. Yes. So. Yeah, I noticed that it pushed out that lactic acid response in terms of like that burn, whereas like it just would limit you after a while. Like if you worked, you know, specifically exclusively more on hypertrophy when I go back in, I wouldn't have that like, um, you know, after so many sets, it was like I could keep going. Yes. Now this next one is, uh, the next point is explosive uh, speed training. Mm. So I remember remember seeing this firsthand as a kid. I actually went to a powerhouse gym um, as a teenager because I had heard about this gym. It's powerhouse and I was you know big into working out and I'd never seen an Olympic lifting area. They actually had a room with a platform, which was rare for a gym in those days. I mean, you see platforms all over the place now, but back in those days, it was rare to see a squat rack, let alone uh, you know an area with chalk and bumper plates. And I saw it and nobody was in there. And I remember I was doing my normal workout and then I heard weights dropping. And I looked in there, there's this very muscular, obviously Olympic lifter. And they had not a lot of weight on the bar. It was like 135 or 185, right? Which it's, you know, I, I would have thought this guy was lifting so much more, but he was lifting it so fast and so explosively, like doing snatches mm -hmm. and cleans. And he wasn't doing tons of reps. He was just doing it super fast. And so I asked this guy, why don't you, you know, lift heavier? I thought, you know, strength training, whatever. And he goes, no, no, no I'm training. I want to move this weight as fast as possible. That's what makes me explosive. And that's mm -hmm. when I learned that explosive training, you can lift heavy weight and try to move it explosively. But if you want to move explosively and fast, you got to use lightweight. Yeah. Yeah, expressing that fast twitch response. It's a totally different a uh, completely different feel. If, if you haven't done that and you haven't gone through, I mean, plyometrics on some level too, yeah. we're talking about speed power. Uh, you don't want to use any weights, but like in, in terms of like using, you know, doing Olympic lifts and all that, the value there is really the acceleration and how quickly you can uh, get through the movement. Now, would you, would you guys attribute that to, because obviously if you're moving a weight that's extremely light for that exercise for you, the amount of muscle damage that you're probably going to do in comparison to a slow grinding heavy rep is, is going to be probably less. Is that, is, so do you think the benefits are coming from most of the CNS training? Oh yeah. And because you are, what you're doing is you're basically training your operating system to be able to fire explosively when you're used to doing like this kind of slower grinding type now of Now the thing. better- the demand increases, so you do get really sore, but you it's do, a little yeah. less damage. But, the, but the, the better you get at it, the more muscle damage you get. What I yeah, mean exactly. by that is you have to learn- you have to teach your body how to contract forcefully with maximal effort uh, in a short period of time, which is not, this doesn't come naturally if you don't train this way. Like you ever take a bodybuilder and have them do like a kettlebell swing explosively and watch them turn it into a front shoulder raise yeah, because yeah. they you just don't know. You see how slow it's coming up? And yes. That, yeah, that all factors They just in. don't know how to do that, right? So when you first do it, whatever force you generate is not what is going to cause damage on your body because you're not really generating a lot of force. But as you get better, you get better at within a second generating tons of force, yeah. and then it does become a so damaging. You turn that amplitude up quite a bit, yes. and then it really affects the muscles. This, by the way, is the most. Um, it's it, it's not the only, but it's probably the most valuable type of strength that you get in sports. Um, you could get look. I don't care how much you could squat and deadlift for a PR, if the guy or girl next to you can move and express their their strength twice as fast as you, you ain't going to catch them and they'll hit harder than you and they'll do everything stronger than you because of the speed 
uh, that's involved. So although grinding slow strength contributes to speed power, mm -hmm. the only train to, the only way to train for speed power is lightweight. You can't like so if you could deadlift yeah. 500 pounds and you want to do fast deadlifts, you got to go down to like 200 pounds to be able to move the bar quickly yeah. and with that kind of explosive yeah. uh, you know power or whatever. This next one's the opposite, and that's the value of slow reps, very slow reps. So 10 second, 15 second negatives and positives. You want to talk about breaking down your rep into small pieces and perfecting every single quarter inch of that rep and connecting to the muscle through every single quarter inch of that rep. Put some light weight on. Give yourself 10 to 15 seconds negative, 10 to 15 seconds positive. It feels like nothing else. It's I just very, saw, very yeah, one of my friends posted a video of a squat with that they did for a, like a one minute eccentric. Oh God. <laughs> so oh. you you just look at this just very incremental, like, you know, quarter of an inch by quarter of an inch down to get down 60 seconds and then whole. And it's just like a, a completely different feel to the exercise, uh, like completely. Oh, well, yeah. this is, uh, I love this. In fact, I did a reel that I know is kind of going viral on our mind pump media page right now, where I was talking about the, you know, eccentric portion of the exercise mm -hmm. that nobody ever does like four seconds. And I used to take it to like 10 seconds with clients when, cause what I found that was really nice, I go really, really light with the weight and then have them do it. And we'll just use like a bicep curl because it's so basic to explain to people. Everybody sees what knows what a standing bicep curl looks like. And I'd have them do like a 10 second rep. But then what I'd be doing is walking around and I'd be yeah. moving their shoulders, yes. pulling their elbows back, telling them to stick their chest up, correcting where their, their, their cervical spine is. And like, I'd be all detailed. And you can't do that if you're moving the weight at like a normal cadence that most people do. So slowing the repetition down and then basically segmenting that, that movement into like 10 parts and really getting them to understand understand the way they should be holding their body while they're doing that movement. Great for teaching. Yeah. So there's yeah. two ways I do this. One is for the hypertrophy benefits of a target muscle. So I can really slow down and target like, oh, I want to feel this right in my hamstrings or I want to feel this right in my lats. So I'll go real slow, real light, and I can do that. The other reason is if I do a comp, uh, like a complex lift or a compound lift and I have a little bit of twinge or pain and I can't quite figure out what part of the rep is causing it. Mm. Then I'll do a super slow rep. And what I do is I adjust my rep as I'm moving the bar to where it doesn't hurt anymore. Okay, that's where my shoulder feels good. And then I'll do yeah. some reps in that position, which will train it so when I go faster, it's the same thing. Yeah, and I would do that with some of my clients, especially when we're doing a barbell squat, and you realize where you lose a lot of the support and stability. So sometimes like because of momentum being a factor in some of the times when they when they do squats, when you really slow it down and go through each one of those angles, like you can see where there's a disconnect and yeah. then you can address it. That totally. Way. Now this last point was kind of what you were talking about, Adam, which is it's a lot easier on the joints. Now, why is it easier on the joints? Well, if your technique is off by one or two degrees, which isn't that bad. In fact, it would be hard to even see by watching someone do a rep. It would be hard for me as a, as a, as a trained professional to look and say, oh, that's one degree off or two degrees off, right? But let's say you work out that way day in and day out for a year, two years, three years. What is being stressed most with that slight deviation in your joints? The knee isn't traveling the way it should perfectly. So the kneecap is kind of pushing to the left a little bit on that groove on the femur, right? Or the shoulder blade isn't depressing quite the way it should. And over time, you develop nagging joint issues. And you're like, well, I work out well. I take care of myself. Like, why is it that my left elbow tends to bother me a little bit? Why is it my knee gets a little bit sore, right? If you go light, those slight deviations uh, don't make that big of a difference. And it's and in back to the original point, the first one, which is you perfect your form and you can obviously correct that issue. That's the key is the form, right? That, that, and that, you go heavy that you have that risk a little bit more of just slightly being off and how much you're wearing on, on the joints. I think of like, a, imagine a door swinging, right? And, and the hinges are your joints. And imagine like some Justin's big ass hanging on the door <laughs> while you close it. Like now, <sighs> now, honestly, even Justin's big ass hanging on that door swinging, that you, it'll, You're fine. it'll be fine at first, but you have no idea the amount of pressure and stress that's going to those hinges. And uh, after years and years of Justin swinging on there, eventually those hinges are coming loose or they're going right. to be, are going to start to separate or pull from the right. wood or whatever. Like Versus that. if you put Doug on it, you got at least <laughs> five right. or six more that's years. Right. Of, yeah. At least five <laughs> more years of Doug hanging on <laughs> operation there. But I mean, that's what I, I visualize that. And it's, and to the, the untrained eye, 
you see the way the door is swinging both with Justin on it or off of it and it doesn't look that different to you but it just slightly being off enough could be putting that that pressure on that hinge that's or right. on those joints and that's why the form is is so important but if you do have really really good form and technique the muscles are what's supposed to be taking all the stress in a movement like that. That's well, right. Yeah, and, and and the body just is it's always trying to assess how much force output to give you, how much power yeah. output to give you based off of how stable your joint is. And so to, to be able to slow down and understand where you're losing that support. So you're losing that muscle tension and that um, that ability to uh, sort of, you know, get get that force to, to, to go through and ground through your body. Um, you, you know, that's that's really what you want to be concerned with is, is being able to slow it down and, and hyper focus on that. Yeah, I'll be quite honest. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm a much better trainer with other people than myself. This is that last this last point is what always makes me go to lighter training. It's and it's I wait too long, right? Yeah. I wait too long in heavy training because I like it so much. Um and I start to feel my joints. So then I go through a cycle of lighter weight. And every single time I do it, I always go, man, I got to do this more often. Oh, I'm building more muscle. Oh, I feel so good. But I get stuck in the other one. By the way, this is why every maps program is phased and why every maps program will include a phase that has higher rep training in. There's yeah. all, every single program to we have. To force you to do that. <laughs> even our yeah. power lifter uh, program, even the one that's for power lifters, includes some elements and phases where you're training in the higher rep range because there's value even if your goal is maximal strength and not muscle hypertrophy. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at MindPumpJustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at MindPumpAdam. And you can find me on Twitter at MindPumpSal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out, and less injury. 